Look, you start, you start. This is huge. Nobody's playing. It's just you. It has to be free. It has to be clear. It has to be present. It was neither free, it was neither clear, and it was absolutely not present. It was introverted. Magic. Where's the magic? You can't play notes. Rex. Damn it. Mahler's Fifth Symphony. The Holy Grail of Orchestral Trumpet Literature. How am I going to play Mahler 5? First, I need to go back, learn about Gustav Mahler and the circumstances under which he wrote his Fifth Symphony. On July 7th, 1860, Gustav Mahler was born in Kaliste, Bohemia of the Austrian Empire. He was son of an Austrian Jewish distiller, hence his parents were not professional musicians. However, Mahler demonstrated his musical gifting as early as the age of four. This was the home he grew up in. The Mahler Foundation provides a wealth of more information and resources such as this image. As part of the German-speaking minority, Mahler experienced much hardship early on. Additionally, his father grew to resent his mother, physically abusing her. I mention things like these because I do believe a composer's background can heavily influence their work. And so as we listen to Mahler, notice the weight and complexity of emotion that his music carries. Movement 1, The Funeral March can be described as the initial stage of the grieving process. A lone voice sounds, a four note rhythm. Each cry grows with intensity. The rhythm heard in this first movement is considered a nod to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Likewise, Mahler's use of thematic interconnection between movements is similar to Beethoven's. Thirdly, both symphonies share the same emotional trajectory, which is the struggle from tormented darkness to brilliant light. The fanfare reappears multiple times throughout the movement. In a way, it never leaves. At the end of the movement, it sounds one last time, and a sforzando snap ends the movement, leaving the listener feeling desolate. Mahler studied at the Vienna Conservatory of Music. Unfortunately, not many of his compositions from school survive today. During his studies, Mahler attended occasional lectures given by Anton Bruckner, and like many students at the time, he was also inspired by Richard Wagner. However, I would like to focus more on Mahler's relationship to Ludwig van Beethoven. In the second movement, Sturm und Drang, the grieving process continues. 
the funeral march motif returns, again mimicking the fate motif from Beethoven's Fifth. Mahler himself was superstitious of the curse of the ninth, that no composer since Beethoven seemed to make it to their tenth symphony. Perhaps Mahler's echo of the fate motif in his own fifth symphony foreshadows the fate of his unfinished tenth symphony. Movement three finds itself to be lively and lovely. The listener seems to be free of the pain in the first two movements. We find more hints of the fate motif throughout. What could this mean? The listener seems to be free of their sadness. But the pain is still there. Movement 4, Adagietto, is lush and at ease. Mahler composed this movement for Alma, his soon-to-be wife. One of Alma's letters mentions a poem Mahler wrote to her. Before we continue, there's another important detail to this story. Right before Mahler wrote his fifth symphony, he wrestled with severe hematochesia. He had to endure two operations in order to fully recover, and he himself described it as a near-death experience. Shortly after, he wrote this symphony. In Mahler's music, life and death are both present, at odds with each other. The first two movements of the symphony wrestled with death itself. The third and fourth movements introduced life and love. The fifth movement could be seen as hope. Movement five brings back themes from previous movements. It sounds fugal in nature, but above all, it is triumphant filled with hope. The symphony began in C-sharp minor, but ends in D major, both breaking classical convention and symbolizing the working through from dark to light. Even after the premiere in 1904, which was full of mixed opinions, Mahler would find himself reorchestrating the symphony for the next several years. In a letter he wrote in February of 1911, he finally exclaimed, 